so good afternoon all of you so i think professor uh, uh, k s babu narayan has also joined for the session so we can start the session uh, so in the morning uh, we had a session by professor and he has discussed about the determination of static and kinematic indeterminacies so this session also will be handled by dr uh, k s babu narayan so i request dr k s babu narayan to take over the session please sir thank you very much Is the screen visible? Anybody? Yes, sir. Visible, sir. Okay. So we saw up to the determination of strain energy for uh, representation of strain energy for axial flexure, shear, and torsion loading in terms of uh, the forces of load kind in terms of displacement, and also we saw the Prototypes of uh, Castigliano's theorem. So the partial derivative of the strain energy is done with respect to displacement gives you the conjugate force. The partial derivative of the strain energy with respect to the complementary strain energy, rather, with respect to the force gives you the conjugate displacement. And for a linear elastic uh, material, the complementary and the strain energy are the same, but still. We should know the subtle difference between the two and when they are applicable, and we should formulate the strain energy equation in the right way to get the desired end result. We will now see the application of whatever we saw in the, in the morning session. We will consider first the example of a truss. Here, here we have an example of a truss work. Can see one, two, three, four, five bars of the truss. And we can see a turnbuckle in the bar BC at the center. Each bar of the truss has a length of about 1.6 meters, 60 degrees. Inclination is 60 degrees, and the lengths are the same. So triangulated, equilateral triangle rather. Each bar of the truss work has a length of 1.6 meters and the area is 250 millimeters squared. The Young's modulus of the material is 2 into 10 to the power of 5 newtons per millimeter squared. The bar BC at the center has a double acting turnbuckle. The turnbuckle is such that there are 13 threads per centimeter, 13 threads per 10 millimeter, or 1.3 threads per millimeter. How many terms will produce a tension of 50 kilo newtons in the bar BC is the question. Simple and straightforward. I repeat again, you have a truss work as shown. All bars are 1.6 meters long. So the bar BC has a turnbuckle in the center. The turnbuckle has 13 threads per centimeter. Each bar has an area of 250 millimeters squared. How many turns of the buckle will induce a force of 50 kilo newton tension in the bar BC is the question. So how we use the strain energy method to work it out, we'll see. How we take, we make use of the symmetry and we take only half the system, two bars, the bar at top with the turn button. We call the force in the bar with the turnbuckle as P and other two inclined bars. One of the inclined bars will be in compression, other will be in tension. Bar AB will be in tension and bar BE will be in compression. And we use the method of joints to determine the bar forces. If the bar forces are F here because of the symmetry and also 
the vertical force balancing needs the bar forces to be the same so 2f cos 60 so these bars are inclined at 60 degree to the horizon so 2f cos 60 should be equal to p so sigma h is equal to 0 at the joint so from that you will get the bar force as p the bar force in ab and be will be p each we set up Chain energies in terms of the bar forces. You know the bar forces now. All bars are now suffering force of P. We write the strain energy equation. That is strain energy total in the system is we have two bars of length L1 that is 1.6 meter and one bar half the length. L2 is only half because we have a turnbuckle at the center. And all bars have the same area, so A1 is equal to A2. We write the strain energy as twice P squared L1 by 2 A1 E1 plus P squared L2 by 2 A2 E. And here, since all bars have the same area, A1 is equal to A2 is equal to A1. And L1 is twice L2. To make the substitution, you will get the strain energy as 1.25 P squared L1 by A1 E1. This is the strain energy total. We have seen the partial differential of strain energy with respect to load gives the conjugate displacement. We are interested in the displacement in the top bar. So the force is P and the based on which we have arrived at the total strain energy and we are differentiating it. If we differentiate the equation of the strain energy in terms of the load P, you know, P squared derivative is 2P. So we get it as 2.5P L1 divided by A1 E. Now we know all the quantities. We substitute for them. 2.5 into P, the bar force to be induced is 50 kilonewtons. So we put it as 50 into 10 to the power of 3 in terms of newtons. L1 is... 1,600 millimeters. 250 is the area of all the bars divided by 2 into 10 to the power of 5 gives us the displacement as 4 mm. And we know the threads are such that there are 30 threads per centimeter. That means there are 30 threads per 10 millimeter. We need a displacement of 4 millimeters. So the number of turns to be given is 13 into 4 by 10, which is 5.2 tons. 5.2 tons of the turn buckle in the system will induce a bar force of 50 kilonewtons in the top member. This is how we use strain energy method or technique to solve this problem. We now move on to a cantilever beam. Determine the deflection under the load for the cantilever beam shown. We have a cantilever beam of span L, which is supporting an end load P. So if we take the coordinate axis from the load at any distance x, this load will cause a moment of P into x. Any moment is moment of all forces either to the right or to the left. So moment at any x from the load will be P into x. And we know the strain energy in the beam can be got by integrating 0 to L m squared by 2 e i dx. So here, since the moment is P into x, m squared will be P squared x squared divided by 2 e i, where here is the flexural rigidity of the beam itself, into dx. The constant terms come out, that is P squared by 2 e i is a constant that does not participate in integration. It comes out. Integral of x squared will be x cubed by 3. And substituting the limits, you will get u as p squared l cubed by 6 e i. The first differential of this with respect to p should give you the displacement. That is from classical Yanos of the RC. If uh, strain energy is represented in terms of the load, the first differential, partial differential with respect to the load will give the conjugate displacement. So if u is p squared l cube by 6 ei, 
the by u by the by p you will get a p l q by 3 e i this is a standard result for a cantilever loaded with a concentrated load at the end the displacement will be given by p l q by 3 e i this is how it works for p p advance okay, now we have an example of a cantilever loaded with uh, uniformly distributed load and you want to determine the deflection at the free end determine the deflection at the free end for the beam shown we have a cantilever beam of span l the load is w per meter w per unit length now we have a problem here in applying the principle we don't have a load at the desired displacement location we need the displacement at the free end the load is uniformly distributed the technique is we introduce a dummy load p at the free end introduce is the dummy load we call it a dummy load p and we determine the moment of all forces to the right of the section x that will be px plus wx squared by 2 px is the moment due to the dummy load w into x is the load to the right and it will be at a distance of x by 2 from the section under consideration so it will be w squared by 2 that gives me the moment at the section x distance from the load itself so now we write the equation for chain energy u as integral 0 to l for the entire beam m squared by 2 ea dx we know the value of m at any section x so we make the substitution that is px plus wx squared by 2 the whole squared now m squared all right this we do and now we want deflection at the free end that is where the dummy load is to get that we should differentiate u with respect to p so if you do this d de by u by de by p what we do is we don't integrate and then differentiate we rather differentiate it first and then do the integration so if you do the differentiation within the integral sign we are getting in there is 1 by 2 ea and the expression px plus w squared by 2 whole square when you differentiate it it becomes 2 times p into x plus w x squared by 2 into x so the p is the variable now w squared by 2 will be a constant and px differentiated with respect to p will be x that is the expression you get so the desired deflection delta can be got as the by u by the by p you are differentiating it and then integrating first you do the differentiation we will get the expression so that is delta is equal to the by u by the by p is integral 0 to l 1 by e i px plus W x squared by 2 into x, and this x is the differential of p x with respect to p. Now this, before integration, what we do is, since p is a dummy load, its value is zero. There is no load there as such. It is only a load we have introduced for our convenience. it is not there ultimately even if you hold it and do all the process at the end you should substitute the value of p as zero so what do we do is before determining the integral value we put the value as zero so delta is the value by the by p is integral of zero to l 1 by e i into p x plus w x squared by 2 into x dx put p as zero after differentiation before integration So if you put p as zero, that p x term vanishes. So what remains is only one by e i w x cube by two d x. And when you integrate this integral of x cube is x to the power of four by four, so you will get the result as one by e i w x to the power of four by eight zero to l. And substituting the limits, you will get the displacement or deflection as w l to the power of four by eight e i. So remember, we'll get back the case of the formally distributed load. We desire we desire to determine the deflection at the free end where there is no load. 
we introduce a dummy load we write the equation for moment then we set up the equation for strain energy we have the equation for the strain energy partial differential of this equation with respect to the load should give me the displacement so what do we do is we do the differentiation before integration and before integration we put the value of the dummy load as zero to get the desired deflection that is how it works hence this method is called dummy load method and in fact you can take the dummy load as unit load also you can take its value as 1 you take the value of the dummy load as 1 it's called the unit load method and since the load is not there in the real structure that will be set to zero before doing the integration the same result will be obtained this method is called the dummy load or the unit load method like for example if we should of p if we were to put the load as one unit load wherever you had p it will be one and since the one also is not there before before integration set it to zero means if you repeat the calculation from the beginning instead of the dummy load as p if you put the value as 1 wherever you have p for example in the first equation mx will not be px it will be 1 into x w squared by 2 and that will be repeated and that when integrated with respect to the dummy load to take the load as p here and proceed then If the load is not there; it is dummy. We set it to zero. We introduce the unit load. It's called the unit load method. We put the value from value called the dummy load method. So now we move on to how this works in any terminal structure. We take the example of a prop cantilever. We have a prop cantilever. Loaded with uniformly distributed load, and uh, the prop reaction, the redundant reaction is done. This prop cantilever is determined to degree one, because you have at the fixed end a vertical reaction and a moment. At the prop, you have the reaction. So there are three unknowns and only two equations from static. So it is determined to degree one. And we are interested in solving them. So what do we do is we take the redundant reaction here shown, prop reaction as R, and we write the equation for the moment. Moment at any x from R will be R times x minus W x squared by two. And if we write the equation for the strain energy, it will be integral zero L one by two E I m squared. M squared is now R x minus W x squared by two the whole squared d x, and we differentiate this with respect to R, and set it equal to zero because the conjugate displacement since it is a redundant reaction, there the displacement is zero. We differentiate it and set it to zero. So one by two e I R x minus W x squared by two to the power of two differentiated will yield. 1 by e i r x minus w squared by 2 into x d x x d x that is r x differentiated with respect to r is x x d x that is zero and on uh, integrating and simplifying first you simplify take x inside it will be r x squared minus w x cube by 2 d x R x squared when integrated will be R x cube by three. W x cube by two integrated will be W x to the power of four by eight. And you put the limits. You will get it as R l cube by three is equal to W l to the power of four by eight. Or the redundant reaction R is three W l by eight. So once the redundant reaction is known, the rest of the beam is known to us. If one reaction is known, the other reaction. At the fixed end has to be W L minus three W L by eight should be five W L by eight, and you can determine what is the moment at the fixed end by taking moment of all other forces about this point. 
or a, that will be of the order of WL squared by 8 anti clockwise. So, this is how we use strain energy method, the statistically analysis, the minimum energy theorem or the least work to get the redundant reaction. We'll go to one more example of, a, of an indeterminate structure. We consider a single way, single story portal frame. All members have the same inertia, let us say. All members have the same inertia, means the size are the same, and the material also is the same, then EI is the same for all the members. We have the beam span as 4 meters, and the height of the column as 4 meters, let us say. Subjected to a concentrated load of 120 kilo at the center of the beam. For a comparison, I told you in the morning there are other methods too which may give you results faster rather than strain energy method. I am just telling you about the moment distribution method just for a comparison. Okay. And here again, since the frame is symmetrical and the loading is symmetrical, what we can do is we can analyze only half the frame. So we analyze only up to the load location. We have two joints A and B. And the members meeting at the joint are A, B, B, A and B, C. And if you work out the distribution factor by taking the distribution factor total as one, and for the beam, since we are cutting it at the and the line of symmetry, the stiffness should be taken as half the stiffness. If you do all that, you will get the distribution factors for BC as about 1 by 3 and for B as 2 by 3. The fixed end moment is WL by 8. So W is 120, L is 8, oh sorry, 4. So 120 into 4 by 8 will give you 60. You do the distribution at B. You have an unbalanced moment of minus 60, one third of that goes to BC, two thirds of that goes to BA, and from BA you carry over to AB half. So that finishes the moment distribution. So you get the end moments in the member. For end AB you have a clockwise moment of 20. For end BA again you have a clockwise moment of 40. So for end of the beam BC and B will be anti-clockwise, minus 40. And these values have all been listed. And once you know these end moments from pre bodies, you can get other values, reaction. And the horizontal reaction at base will be 40 plus 20. 60 divided by 4 should be 15 kN. The vertical reaction at base should be 60 which is the beam reaction transmitted through the column. What happens in moment distribution? In one cycle, simple and straightforward, you'll get this. Why in the morning I mentioned, in some situations, strain energy can be strenuous. There are other methods which can work faster. But there are situations, there are other methods, maybe the situation is that we have to consider as uh, pathos. So, you have so many methods in uh, structural mechanics. You have the three moments, you have the slope deflection, you have the columnology, you have the strain energy, you have the virtual work. So, the analyst should know where which method works better, like a surgeon having his toolkit. So you should know where which method is to be employed. Many of them are situation specific. All right, this is only for comparison. From the moment distribution, we have got this as the moment in the element and also the forces, shear forces and actual forces. So what happens if we try the chain energy will chain energy method for the same frame? So what we do is we go to the end D. This frame is indeterminate to degree 3, 3 into number of closed circuits, 1 minus number of releases, none, will give you the degree of indeterminacy as 3. And if you take end D, we have VD, the vertical reaction, 
HD, the horizontal reaction, and MD, the moment, or the redundant reaction to be determined later. We take them as BD, HD, and MD. And we set up moment equation. We write the moments for various elements M, AB, that is element AB, then element BC and CD. And we can take over convenience origins. If you take the because now I have taken the origin for A B and A and I have shown X as the direction. In terms of X, I will write the distance X, whatever is the value of the moment, meeting moment at that section. And similarly for M C B, I set up the equation for the moment in terms of coordinate Y with the origin at C. And I write equation for the moment in the element DC with the origin at D. So we can write this equation. Once the moment values are known to us, we substitute these moment values in the equation for strain energy. And once we write the strain energy equation, differentiating them with respect to the loads or the moment. Is BD, MD, and HD should give us the conjugate displacement. And what is happening here is these are the redundant reactions where the conjugate displacements are all zero. So what do we do is we set up the equation for the strain energy. We differentiate it with respect to these redundant reactions, BD, MD, and HD, and equate them to zero. If you do that, you will get three equations in terms of MD, VD, and HD. It will be simultaneous equation. And when then those simultaneous equations are solved, you will get the value for the desired redundant reaction. Which you should set up. You should first write equation for moment in the element. And then write equation for strain energy. Then do the differentiation. The differentiation will yield you simultaneous equation in terms of the unknown redundant reaction and you should solve the simultaneous equation to get the values of the unknown redundant reaction that is medium dH. That is how the method works for a frame. And to reduce the effort and to make it even faster, what we can do is in this frame again, like in moment distribution method, we have utilized the symmetry. Here again, you can utilize the symmetry. Utilizing symmetry about the location E. About the location E, there is a load acts. The slope has to be zero. And we also ignore actual deformation. We ignore the actual deformation, we can take the horizontal displacement at that location as zero. Now we set up moment equations for the elements remaining from the center to B, that is E to B and B to A. I call it the location where I have taken the symmetry, the operative. ME is the moment I want to determine. HE is the horizontal axial force I want to determine. I know the shear at that point. Has to be the column reaction with 60 downward. That, that value is known to me. Knowing the shear as 60, I try to get ME and HE by setting up equation for them. So, what I do is for the element DB, we take the origin at X and we write the equation for a moment. And we will follow the convention clockwise positive, anticlockwise negative. So ME is anticlockwise, so minus ME plus 60H. 60 is acting downwards, UX will be a clockwise moment. Similarly, we write equation for moment along BA at any location Y. We set up equation for the moment. And we write the moment equation as ME anticlockwise, so minus HE into Y. Again, anti clockwise minus 60 into 2. The load 60 kilonewtons is acting at a distance of the 
width of uh, span of the beam, that is 2 meter. So it is plus 120. These moments we know. And m squared by 2 ea dh is the strain energy stored due to flexure. So we write u as 0 to 2 minus mv plus 60 x the whole square divided by 2 ea dx plus 0 to 4 for ba the total length is 4 meter so 0 to 4 minus mv minus h into y plus 120 the whole square divided by 2 ea dy which is the expression for the strain energy and we know the partial differential of strain energy with respect to the force should give the conjugate displacement. If it is moment, it should give the slope. If it is load, it should give the displacement. Okay, we write de by u by de by me. We do the differentiation under the integral sign. And there you can see the equation. The first term will be minus me. 2 and minus me 0 to 2 me minus me plus 60 and then into minus 1 and 2 and 2 cancel there is a 2 cancel there is a small error the 2 cancel here again if you differentiate 0 to 4 2 cancel the 2 in the denominator will not be there so you are differentiating that will be corrected in the in the file will be given to you. you when you differentiate where the two cancel with the two in the denominator will not be there. And the E I again cancel. In fact, straight away you can take off two EI because they are setting it equal to zero. Multiplying through by two EI, multiplying through by two EI, and uh, the top two will have no meaning. We will get the equations below. Whatever you can deem now equation return as the two has been cancelled for both the equations with the zero on the right hand side. On simplification, you will get the equation for. The first, that is the by u by the by me as 6 m e plus 8 h e is equal to 600. Similarly, if you differentiate this with respect to h e, other redundant, and equate it to 0, you will get another equation. It will be 8 m e plus 64 by 3 h e is equal to 960. These are simultaneous equations. And you can solve them to get the value of me and h e. And if you solve these two equations for the values of me and h e, you get me as 80 kilo newton meter and h e as 15 kilo newton, which are the desired results and which compare with what you got from the moment distribution method. Same results that you got from the moment distribution method. And what is very important here is we will get back. Get back. Yes. When you consider the whole frame also, you have taken the redundant reactions as VD, HD, and MD. They have been shown. VD is vertically up, HD is to the left, and MD is anti-clockwise. So I can take the sense as anything I want. And if the end result is positive, the sense I have taken is correct. If at the end result I get a negative value, it should be reversed. Generally, by intuition, you can judge which should be the direction of the, like for example, VD has to be up then HD has to be to the left and MD has to be anticlockwise. This you know from individual. Usually, individual tells you what should be the sense of 
the redundant reaction. If you have taken it wrong, the assumed direction of the tens of the redundant taken is wrong in the calculation, the end result will be negative. Meaning, the sense should be reversed. That's all. Even in the, in the case of shortcut method, I've taken the horizontal HE to the left and ME as anti clockwise. This thing, the moment there has to be taken at the center of the table. So you get positive results. If you get <coughs> negative results after having worked out the whole problem, it means assume direction should be reversed. I think you understood. I'll tell you this again. You are cutting and making use of symmetry. You know the shear is 60. You are taking HE as the horizontal reaction or the axial force and MB as the moment. We are setting up equations for the moment and we are writing the equation for the strain energy and we have seen the partial derivative of the strain energy with respect to moment should give you the slope or the angle with respect to load should give you the displacement or deflection so the volume Debye by debye me. We know at the center of the span of the beam, the slope has to be zero. So debye by debye me, we are equating to zero. We are doing the calculation. Finally, we land up with 6 mb plus 8 hg is equal to 600. Similarly, we do the partial differentiation for hg. And since we are ignoring axial deformation, we can write debye by debye hg is equal to zero. We get this equation 8 mb plus 64 by 3 he should be equal to 960. And we have two equations, just two unknowns. We solve for them. We get the values. The moment at the center as 80 kilonewton meter and he as 15, which are correct. We compare it with what we got the moment distribution. Okay. Here you see the actual force we are getting as 15 is reflected by the same energy method also. And if you see the beam, the end moments are 40 kN meter each. The static moment at the center total will be WL by 4. W is 120, L is 4 by 4. Total is 120. Negative moments at the end since they are 40, the positive moment at center, the dragging moment at center should be 80. This is the value we got from the analysis just shown. And we move on. See, many times you will come across the uh, beams of varying energy. So far, all of our discussion was uh, dealing with prismatic section. Prismatic is the same section through we encounter sections where the inertia varies. Inertia need not necessarily be the same through. If that is the case, how we make use of strain energy method, we'll see here. First, we'll consider a cantilever loaded with uniformly distributed load. Prismatic, same section through. PI is the same through. We want uh, Displacement at the free end. As you have seen, what we do is we introduce the dummy load P. We set up the equation for strain energy. U is integral 0 to L1 by 2 EI PX squared to X squared by 2 the whole squared DX. Deba U by Deba P should give me the desired displacement. If I do that, if I do the differentiation. Deba U by Deba P is 2 cancel, 1 by EI remains. And uh, undifferentiated Px was W squared by 2, and what is inside the bracket differentiated with respect to P is the x, dx. And since P is dummy, that does not participate. So we set to 0, and what remains is Wx cubed by 2. 
non integration it will be wx to the power of 4 by 8 and non substitution of the limit 0 to l we get it as wl squared by 8 so wl to the power of 4 by 8 ei is the desired deflection this is for prismatic section now what if uh, i varies linearly what do you mean by linear variation is it is a linear equation i if it is i at the fixed end it is zero at the tip at any distance x from the tip i will be given by i divided by l into x the relationship the variation of i is linear because i is the maximum in the fixed end and l is the span of the beam itself both are constant so it is an equation of the form y is equal to ax linear relation y varies linearly from zero at the tip to i at the fixed end how we make use of synergy geometry again we will put the dummy load p and we know the equation for moment is other layer p into x plus w x squared by 2 and x squared is p x plus w x squared by 2 the whole squared 1 by 2 e i here is the difference 1 by 2 e is the same throw whereas i is not i at the location where we are writing the moment for the small element is i x by l it is i at the fixed end zero at the free end the location where we have taken the section for the small element it will be i into x by l here this is the calculation that needs to be done to address we should write i in terms of x again this is function of x that we do okay the by u by the by p partial differential of strain energy with respect to the load should be given the desired displacement i do it with respect to p so So when two cancel, the numerator and the denominator, I get p x plus w x squared by two into two. What is inside the bracket is to be differentiated with respect to p. W x squared by two is a constant. The differential of p x with respect to p is x. That remains. And remember, you have l the i x by l that l going to the numerator and x remaining in the denominator. And that one x cancels with the x before the dx. And uh, on vanishing the dummy load, on substituting zero for the dummy load p, the whole expression becomes l by e i w x squared by two dx to be integrated from zero to l. So w e i two l they all do not participate in integration. X squared participates. X squared is x cubed by three. On substitution of zero to l, we get the displacement of w l to the power of four by six e. This is the difference. Now the displacement, if the beam is of linearly varying inertia, is more than a prismatic beam. The prismatic beam is stiffer than. The beam of varying energy. Now so we have removed the material. So this is a great consideration. Sometimes what happens? Hence, why I specifically explained you this. And I have worked this out. We will go to the previous slide. First, you have a prismatic beam. Then you have a varying beam. Always in a cantilever, what happens? The moments are maximum at the fixed end, and towards the free end, the moments are smaller, and at the free end it vanishes. So this may prompt us to reduce the beam section as we go towards the end. Definitely, some economy will be achieved. Some savings can be done. By doing this, but we should remember deflection will increase as we have seen. 
What will happen to the reflection is uh, if it is a prismatic beam, it is WL to the power of 4 by 8 here. But if it is a beam of varying energy, it is WL to the power of 4 by 6 here. 1 by 6 and 1 by 8. The reflection is going to increase. That should be there in your mind. Because you have to satisfy serviceability criteria also, not alone strength. The requirements on stiffness too. Then the check should be made. Right? This is how we can employ strain energy method in beams of varying energy. So strain energy methods are extensively used in dynamics. And also in fracture mechanics. Energy methods are very popular in dynamic analysis and also in fracture mechanics. So here is one example how we can use the thin energy method in dynamics. The question is a fragile glass sphere, maybe a flower vase or whatever, of mass 5 kgs, mass. Fragile glass sphere of mass 5 kg surrounded by packing material of negligible damping, we are ignoring damping, but of stiffness 10 newton per millimeter. The stiffness of the packing material is 10 newton per millimeter. This glass sphere is inside a box surrounded by this packing material with a given stiffness. And the box itself is of negligible mass. If the box is dropped from a height of one meter and impact, impact is plastic, what happens by impact is plastic if the coefficient of restitution is zero, means the whole energy transfer takes place. Determine the amplitude of vibration, amplitude of vibration, maximum amplitude of vibration and the maximum acceleration of glass wave in terms of g, in terms of acceleration due to gravity, the question. The mass of the glass wave is 5 kg. The stiffness of the packing material is 10 newton per millimeter. This glass wave is surrounded by this packing material. The whole thing is inside a box. When somebody drops this box from a height of 1 meter, the impact, impact is plastic. The question is what is going to be the amplitude of vibration? Amplitude is amplitude extent to which the glass wave moves. And the maximum acceleration of the glass wave in terms of acceleration due to gravity. So you know, once we know the stiffness of the packing material, that is K, stiffness is load required to cause unit displacement. If K is known, K into X is the force itself. If force is K into X, displacement is X. Force into displacement divided by 2 should give me the work or energy. So half Kx squared is the strain energy, the energy absorbed by the packing material. M into G into H, the mass, where we are ignoring the mass or the weight of the box itself, of negligible mass. So we are considering only of the glass wave. That is given as 5 kg. M into G into H is the potential energy lost in the event of the box being dropped. So M into G into H should be equal to half K X squared. So we know K is 10 Newton per millimeter. We convert it into Newton per meter, because we are substituting for G in terms of meters per second squared. So it becomes 10,000 Newton per meter. 10 Newton per millimeter. 10,000 Newton per meter. X squared is to be determined. That should be equal to 5, which is the mass of the glass wave itself. M into G, acceleration due to gravity is 9.81 meters per second squared. And H is the height of the drop. Only thing unknown is X, the amplitude of the vibration. So 
strong solution, you get it as 99 millimeter. Amplitude of vibration of the glassware inside the packing material is 99 millimeter. Now the force on the glassware, once you know the once you know the displacement or the amplitude, k into x will give you the force. The force on the glassware, when the action and reaction are equal and opposite. So kx is the force on the glassware. K is known, and the displacement is known. K is 10,000 into 0 0.099 will give you the force as 990 Newton. You know, force is mass into acceleration. You know, the mass of the glassware, mass of the glassware is 5 kg. Dividing the force by the mass, you get the acceleration of the glassware. The acceleration is 990 divided by 5 is 198 meters per second squared. And in terms of g, it is almost 20.2 g. This is how we can use it in several exercises with dynamic loading is ignored. So how we decide how a fragile object needs to be packed, what should be the packing material. That is why you must have seen many cartons handled with care, fragile inside, where it should be hooked, how it should be handled, and so on and so forth. All such exercises, whatever knowledge you have of energy, strain energy, will come to a great help. So one example on dynamics. We move to the next one. Determine the fundamental frequency of assembly supported beam by so using chain energy method. How we can do this? Thing? What we do is we assume the mode shape. The mode shape is the shape the object takes when it vibrates. For a beam vibrating in the first mode. That is the shape it can take. If you can assume an equation for the mode shape, then the rest of the problem becomes very simple. Since here we have sketched the mode shape, but if you see, it is half sine wave. It is a half sine wave. Sine 0 is 0. Sine 90 is maximum. Sine 180 is again 0. And so on and so forth. So we assume the mode shape of the sinusoidal pattern, then we can write an equation for the mode shape. We will write it as y is equal to minus delta sin pi x by L for the shape assumed and shown there. I have written minus delta because the displacement has been shown downward. So I will write it as y minus delta sin pi x by L. So when you assume this mode shape and write the equation, you should honor, you should honor the compatibility and kinematics. So what is happening is, you take this as the mode shape. The displacement is zero, and x is zero. We will get it. N zero is zero. The displacement is zero when x is L. So nine hundred eighty is also zero. Right. So you can be very careful in assuming equation for the shape. Okay, we assume it as y is equal to minus delta, where delta is the maximum displacement at the center. Okay. Minus delta to sine pi x by L, we assume as the mode shape. First differential, y is the displacement. First differential gives me the slope. The second differential should give me the curvature. Why double dash? It's the curvature. So when we wrote the equations for strain energy in terms of loads and displacements, if you remember, in terms of displacement, we wrote it as EI by 2 into theta squared. 
eta of the flow which is curvature into length right so eta is curvature into length so if you write it in terms of the curvature the equation for energy is what we have written here is zero to l half e i y double dash square d x So G I, what is y double dash is d two y by d x two. Very easy to understand. G I into d two y by d x two is m. You know. So if you do this y double dash the whole square, if you take one of the y double dashes to the E I side, G I into d two y by d x two is m. Right? And y double dash is m by m. So the curvature is. Yeah, into d to y by d x two is equal to m. So y double dash is m by e i. So we are writing m squared by two e i in terms of the curvature. So we want to substitute the values that we have assumed. So half e i into y double dash the whole square d x will be the internal work. That should be equated to the work done by the external load. Here we have the external load as the mass of mass into the acceleration gives me the force into distance gives me the work and half half is because I'm taking it as real work. I'm equating internal work to external work. So I have mass per unit length as m. I take a small element anywhere of denomination dx. So m into dx which should give me the small mass. Omega squared into displacement. Omega squared into amplitude is acceleration. So uh, displacement will always be in terms of meter. And omega is radians per second. Radian has no unit. It's a ratio. In second squared is meters per second squared. Should be acceleration. So that will be the force, small force, into distance. So y is delta sine pi x by l. Would be the work done by the external force. Mass into acceleration is force into distance by two. Would give me the external work, and I am equating it to the internal energy. Since here I know y double dash is delta pi squared by l squared sine pi x by l. I substitute in the equation, the left hand side. So when we do the substitution for y double dash, we get one by two e i delta squared pi to the power of four by l to the power of four times squared pi x by l dx is equal to zero to l m m is the mass per unit length omega squared delta squared by two times squared pi x by l dx. Now simplifying, we get half delta squared pi to the power of four by e i l to the power of four m by two omega squared delta squared delta squared cancel half cancel. I get omega squared is called the circular frequency squared. The circular frequency I will get as pi squared under root of e i by m l to the power of four. Is a circular frequency, and we know omega is two pi into y. Omega is two pi into y. If I divide this by two pi, I get y in hertz, in cycles per second, in radians per second, cycles per second in hertz, and one over it is a time period. State of it. I get the frequency from the energy method. So what is interesting here is the correctness of the values that you get is decided by what equation you assume for the motion. The closer you are to reality, the closer will be will be the values that you obtain. 
so you can use strain and energy concept even for determination of frequency so we will rush through this exercise again determination of fundamental frequency simply supported i considered this as example we assume a mode shift but this is called as the rally the rally in this method and all which is a precursor to one the finite element but you can understand this already familiarity or understanding of apm will be easy we want to determine the fundamental frequency of the simply supported beam so what we are doing is we are assuming a mode shape for the mode shape assume we are trying to get a equation and we are fitting y is equal to delta sin phi x by l it is correct because it is honoring the geometric and condition it is given a phase the representation of the vibration mode so that x is equal to 0 the displacement should be 0 it is and then x is equal to l again the displacement should be 0 it is the maximum displacement should be at the center it is in terms of the displacement at the center maximum that is delta we represent this as the mode shape in fact uh, it cancels out whenever you take a delta the so particle bit in the cancel in the equation it cancels out later once you write this equation for y you can get the first differential it will be minus delta differential of sin h cross so it is cos pi x pi l and what is inside is pi x pi l differentiated will give you pi by l differentiate it again we will get it as delta pi squared by l squared sin pi x pi l because differential of cross is minus pi you know why double dash now and also why so remember in the morning session we saw in and the equations can be written in terms of the loads in terms of the displacement here what is the return on the left hand side is in terms of the displacement if you write it then in terms of the load morning i requested you to remember always if you are writing in an equation in terms of the loads the rigidity terms appear in the denominator if you write them in terms of the displacement rigidity terms appear in the numerator so here we have the rigidity term in the numerator ri r ei y double dash whole square dx we equate this internal work or in chain energy to external work external work will be mass into acceleration into distance by 2 we take a small element for this elemental uh, size of dx the mass should be m into dx because m is mass per unit length but half is average so we have seen displacement and load gradually applied we assume we'll have either average of the load or average of the displacement into load average displacement into load or average load into displacement so half m into dx into that is acceleration omega squared into amplitude which is the acceleration everybody knows fundamentals of dynamics j omega squared okay so amplitude will always be in meter omega squared circular frequency will be radian omega is circular frequency will be radian per second square will be per second squared so it will be meter per second squared should have the units of acceleration the mass in acceleration is 4 the displacement itself at the location where you are taking this mass divided by 2 should give you the work 
fixture and we are integrating for the whole p 0 to l non integration after the substitution of the corresponding values for displacement and the curvature and simplify can first get omega square in the square of the particular frequency taking the square root you will get circular frequency so since omega is 2 pi into f you can get frequency by dividing the circular frequency by 2 pi you can check for unit consistency pi and 2 are constants you have square root of e i by m l to the power of 4 e is always newtons per meter square or kilonewtons per meter square whatever let us take it as newtons per meter square. E is newtons per meter square into I. I is meter to the power of 4. So there it will be newton meter square. Remain. At the bottom, newton is kg meter per second square. So mass into acceleration. 1 kg mass accelerating with mass meter per second square is 1 newton. So there you will get it as Newton meter squared into meter divided by second square. And here at the bottom you have lower case m, which is mass per unit length. Mass per unit length is kg per meter. N2, L to the power of 4 is meter to the power of 4. So what remains is only per second squared under root will be per second in cycles per unit. The third is called frequency. Circular frequency omega is radian square. One radian is two into pi. So this is how, how chain and the method work various situations. We will rush through the entire presentation. Just see what we saw. Yes, we saw the case of a articulated truss with bars actually loaded. We use clean analogy to get the number of turns the turn buckle to produce the desired tension. As the next example, we saw we get the displacement, the free and deflection we can deliver is subjected to a concentrated load. And then we saw what if we do not have a load at the desired location where we want the deflection. For example, a cantilever beam with uniformly distributed load. So we learned we can introduce dummy or the unit load if the desired deflection. Then we saw how we utilize the energy method in an indeterminate beam. This is the example of the top cantilever. We determine the redundant reaction. It is indeterminate to degree one. Determination of one reaction is enough to know the rest of the beam. Then we advance to frame. For comparison, we even did the analysis by shortcut and distribution method for the values of the member forces. Then we applied the strain energy by how, how we can apply strain energy method. The analysis of the same frame where we took at one of the ends the redundant reaction, VDHD and MD, and how we can set up the moment equation taking regions ready equation for the moment then this moment equation will be this moment equation will be used to write the state energy equation and then once the state energy equations are available to us we can differentiate them with respect to the redundant reaction there are three of them in this case so that will get us three simultaneous equations which on solving 
will get of the value of the desired return entry of CDMD and HD. And to reduce the effort, we can utilize the symmetry that was explained. We set up the moment equation for the structure cut utilized as shown. We reduce our efforts. So three equations, we reduce them to two now. We set up the moment equation, we write the spin energy equation. And then we differentiate to get the equations to be solved for any energy and solution of the simultaneous equation. We get required results. We compared it with whatever we got from the moment distribution. Then we check how strain energy can be utilized. We have scheme of varying inertia, or elements of varying inertia. We try to represent the variation in inertia with equation in terms of the coordinate. Then we have make substitution for the inertia value, the equation for strain energy. We get the desired. Response. And uh, also, we saw it is possible to adopt schemes of varying inertia or varying section. The first step is uh, better, as uh, you have seen, the moment values are not necessarily the same everywhere. We can give the desired shape. At the same time, we should remember. In comparison of the reflection values we got for the prismatic beam, and also for beam of varying inertia in case of the cantilever, reflections need to be checked and ascertained before adopting the size of the right from strength calculation for such exercises in an element that can be of great utility. And also, we have seen and we have used. Dynamics determining the dynamic effects. Also, the representation of energy in terms of displacements will provide us a means of getting frequency. Well, that was what I desired to convey to you all as possibilities with. Strain energy method. Thank you very much for the very patient hearing. The thanks Dr. Komuda for the opportunity, for the great experience to be with you all today in this event. Thank you very much. So, thank you very much, sir. So, participants, if you have any queries, you can uh, unmute yourself and ask. Yes. Yes, you can uh, post it in the chat box also. Chat box also. I just gave you all a glimpse of what energy is all about. How best it can be utilized various patients. I also reminded you we have many methods. We have the moment they should be coming with the gun is. Rotation methods, top deflection, color analogy, on and so So many methods. One definitely will get a doubt as to why so many methods. I give you the analogy of the toolbox. Different methods, excellent in different There is nothing like one for all. So, situation specific, and we should decide. The current or the given situation, what works the best, whatever strain energy, however way it can be utilized with the analysis. We just gave a glimpse. We will do much more visiting to library, reading a lot. Fantastic uh, 
books are available on helmet system or master that of structural engineering which you all very well have great time sir so so uh, so if uh, there are no more questions i would like to propose a vote of thanks uh, so on behalf of management of svc and head of our department dr r kumuda coordinator of this six days online fdp program and i university i would like to express my sincere thanks to dr k babu narayanan for giving a wide courage uh, coverage to the strain energy principles for determinate and indeterminate structures and strain energy in dynamics so with these few words we like to end up the session so thank you so much uh, sir for joining with us so uh, we like to have a group photo at the end of uh, every session sir kindly join us for the uh, group photo so participants yes sir thank you very yes, much sir. thanks to dr kumuda too yes sir yes sir thank you dr kumuda yes sir yes sir yes, i'll definitely uh, convey it sir so uh, participants kindly uh, switch on your video quickly join for the video so that we can we can have a group photo it's sir yes please so thank you very much thank you very much uh, thank you all the participants okay thank you sir yes sir yes sir thank you so much thank you sir thank you sir so thank you all for uh, joining this uh, session 3 of today's ftp program so we have uh, uh, in another few minutes we have uh, we are going to start the last session of today's program so kindly join for the session on time thank you thank you ma'am thank you